Hello! Finally, we have come to our most important topic and will talk today about the origin and development of medicine, which is practiced in modern time, namely about the emergency of scientific medicine. For thousands of years, medical scholars developed and accumulated knowledge about human health and disease. First, it was unorganized and based on irrational worldview. Then, it became organized and subordinated by government. With Hippocrates, it went from mystical to rational approach. With scholars of Renaissance and Enlightenment, it became experimental. All this long way was passed in order to make a real explosion of discoveries in the 19th century which completely changed medicine and the idea of health and disease. By that time, almost all knowledge about pathology that physicians collected during past millenniums underwent rethinking and refutation. Therefore, some scholars even suggest that there was no real medicine until 19th century. Modern medicine is a big topic because of significant amount of changes happened in this field in 19th and 20th centuries. Therefore, this topic is separated into a few thematic subtopics. In this part, we are going to touch the most important and general part of the history of modern medicine, the development of modern understanding of pathology. In the subsequent parts, we will look at parallel development of other parts of medicine like introduction of newly invented instruments that revolutionized medical diagnostics and at the development of some medical branches like surgery and psychiatry that underwent huge renovation during 19th century. The new idea about pathology developed gradually. As you know, during the Enlightenment, pathological anatomy emerged. At the turn of the 19th century, this science began to dominate medicine and formed a new vision of the disease. In contrast to the Greek holism and humoral theory, the new vision of the disease emerged as a solid and localized pathology in body. Following it, a pathophysiological understanding of the disease began to develop, according to which disease is a dynamic deviation from the normal state of the body. The invention of high-quality microscopes in the second quarter of the 19th century led to the flourishing of histology and emergency of the cellular theory of the origin of diseases. In addition, the microscopes paved the way for further study of the microscopic world, and in the second half of the 19th century Louis Pasteur discovered the role of microorganisms in pathogenesis. This led to the discovery of the essence of immunity and vaccination. The advent of Darwinism and further immersion to the microscopic world led to the emergency of genetics and understanding the role of genes in human health. Today we will talk about all these steps in more detail. But first, let's find out what caused the spark that led to the explosion of 19th century medical innovations. The starting point of the new medicine can be considered the French Revolution, which happened at the end of the Enlightenment. It completely changed the power in France from monarchy to the ideas of liberal democracy, equality and emancipation. New power crossed out the old traditions and gave way to everything new that seemed to be opposed to the old traditions of monarchy. In medicine, this meant that surgeons who were on the sideline of medicine before and practiced in private offices appeared in the very center of events and took a leading position in process of further development of medicine. Medical education broke away from the theory and became rather practical, 
Large clinics, where medical practice converged with scientific experiments and teaching, were established to treat ordinary people. But ordinary people also had to make concessions to the revolution. In response to free treatment, they had to silently agree to experimental operations and, most importantly, not to protest against the autopsies of their dead relatives. Thus, the Parisian clinics, which were previously under the control of the Church, became secularized scientific and educational centers, where students from all over the world flocked. Returning home, they spread a new approach to their nations. The number of autopsies in Paris at that time was incredible. This led to the flourishing of post-mortem diagnosis. All diseased patients were examined in the section halls of clinics by the doctors who treated them. They compared the pathologies discovered in dead bodies to the complaints that patients had when they were alive and thus established the links between specific solid and local pathologies in dead body with specific disease manifestations in live patients. Thus, Parisian doctors put pathological anatomy at the forefront of understanding the disease and tried to understand the development of diseases by their consequences in the body. In other words, they became detectives on the trial of the disease trying to find evidence at the crime scene, that is, in the dead body. The accumulation of such data allowed doctors to better understand the processes that were going on in the bodies of the live patients with the same disease. So they were able to use information gathered from their dead patients in sake of better helping all their future patients. The weak point of this method was that it worked either with widespread diseases, because they provided a lot of material for observation, or with such diseases that had vivid external and internal manifestations. However, in Paris in the early 19th century, post-mortem diagnosis was widespread, because the most common disease of the France at that time was tuberculosis which has very vivid characteristic features both in the appearance of patients and their internal organs. This gave rise to French doctors' confidence in the effectiveness of post-mortem approach to diagnosis. Thus, the flourishing of pathological anatomy in Paris led to the formation of opposites of the old Greek school which was based on holism and humoral theory, because the new Parisian school was now based on localism and solidism. Instead of understanding the disease as damage to the body as a whole, rather than its individual parts, an opposite understanding emerged, that the body as a whole is healthy, but the disease appears in it in the form of local pathology. The same way Instead of the Greek search for the balance of fluids, Parisian doctors were now looking for the solid pathology in the body. Almost immediately after emergency of the pathological approach, its opposition appeared, the pathophysiological approach. Pathophysiologists argued that the disease is not a local solid pathology, that settled in the body as a separate and unnatural creature. By their point of view, diseased organism is the same organism, but with the deviation of some internal processes. So health, according to them, was the correct balance of physiological processes in the body, and disease was viewed as the physiological imbalance which only in some cases manifests itself in specific organs in form of visible pathology, as a result of malfunctions of internal processes. Thus, proponents of this approach revived theories of balance and holism, but based them on the new scientific understanding. 
Since the old theory of balance was again at the center of medicine, the old methods of restoring balance started to become popular again. In the first half of the 19th century, bloodletting became the most common treatment. The only innovation was that they led the blood now not with knife, but with leeches. French physician François Brousseau, the author of the pathophysiological hypothesis, was considered one of the bloodiest doctors in the history of medicine, because he could treat his patients with up to 50 leeches at a time. His followers went even further. For example, the famous Russian surgeon Nikolai Pirogov mentioned in his memoirs that his teachers at Moscow University could prescribe their patients 80 leeches at a time. Doctors used leeches so often that the creature started to symbolize medicine. In this caricature of the first half of the 19th century, you can see French doctors embodied as leeches, who sucked all the juices out of the patient and then prescribed him a strict Hippocratic diet. Eventually, the popularity of bloodletting led to an increased demand for leeches and made them too expensive. Therefore, an alternative way of conducting bloodletting was invented, the so-called mechanical leeches. Of course, bloodletting was not effective, but the old Roman principle post hoc ergo propter hoc still worked, and doctors continued to believe that the cause of patients' recovery was bloodletting. As you already know, the first doctor to address this problem was Pierre Louis. He was a young French doctor who studied in Paris. Then he traveled the Europe for a long time and finally settled in Ukraine. He worked successfully in Odessa for four years, but in 1820s, during the epidemic of diphtheria, Pierre Louis felt his inability to rescue his patients from the disease and despaired of the therapeutic methods of his time. He returned to Paris and began to work for free in the clinic, where he used statistical methods to study the effectiveness of different ways of medical treatment. As a result, he came to the same conclusion that Hippocrates came to more than 2000 years before him. That patients who were not treated in any way recovered in the same way, and sometimes even faster, as those who were intensively treated with bloodletting. This experience of Pierre Louis gave impetus for the quantitative methods in medicine, medical statistics, and the revival of Hippocratic approach that in 19th century became known as the concept of self-limited disease. Let's return to the development of ideas about pathology. As we have seen, these ideas were still focused on the macro level, despite the fact that microscopes were already in use and scientists knew about cells and microorganisms. It was because the quality of microscopy was still too low to use it in medicine and it was impossible to rely on it because the optical system of that time gave a very strong chromatic and spherical image distortion. Thus, the need for the study of the human body at the microscopic level was stopped by the lack of quality of microscopes. Surprisingly, this problem was solved not by a scientist, but by an ordinary British winemaker, Joseph Jackson Lister the father of the future famous surgeon about which we will talk in the next parts of the lecture. In 1826, in his spare time, Lister developed a microscope with achromatic lenses and greatly improved image quality. This microscope opened new horizons for histology, and very soon scientists began to make discovery after discovery in this field of knowledge. The next important step of the introduction of the microscope into science was a beginning of mass production of microscopes by Carl Zeiss in Germany. 
He produced high-quality microscopes for cheap, making it accessible for students and young doctors. New potentials of microscopy allowed doctors to look even deeper into the human body in search for pathology. The smallest structure under the study became the cell. And so, in the middle of the 19th century, a new hypothesis about the nature of the disease appeared – the cell theory of Rudolf Virchow. He argued that all cells in the world are descended from one ancient cell and are generated from her by division. Beside medicine, Virchow was very passionate with politics, so he usually compared it with medicine. He imagined organism as a cell state, in which every cell is a citizen. Disease, according to him, is the conflict of the citizens of the state brought about by the actions of external forces. Therefore, in his opinion, disease can be caused by abnormal changes in the cell, which subsequently multiplies by division, leading to the organ malfunction. But this vision of pathology didn't explain all diseases, especially infectious, nor did it explain what causes abnormal cell development. Therefore, most scientists of the time have returned to the religious idea that infectious disease can appear by itself, just from the empty air or from rotten matter. Scientists were prompted to disbelief by the appearance of worms in the rotten meat without any obvious cause. They couldn't manage to see how insects lay eggs into meat, and so believed that worms appeared in rotten meat from the empty air, out of nothing. This coincided with the religious worldview, because according to the Bible, God created the world out of nothing. In the early 60s of 19th century, the French chemist Louis Pasteur began to study the fermentation of beer and wine. He concluded that the cause of fermentation processes are microorganisms and that they are the cause of diseases that damage plants. According to Pasteur, these microorganisms were not born out of nothing, but were multiplying in the air in large numbers. Therefore, he emphasized that life cannot come from nothing, but only from another life. Of course, no one agreed to believe Pasteur's words, especially after other scientists showed that if liquid is boiled and all microorganisms inside of it are killed, after some time the same liquid spontaneously becomes populated with live organisms again. So they concluded that life can be spontaneously born from nothing. To prove this hypothesis was wrong, Pasteur conducted a famous experiment. He knew that bacteria grow in meat broth, that if broth has been boiled in a sealed container, bacteria will be exterminated and will not be able to repopulate it. He also knew that bacteria are found in dust particles that float in the air. So his premise was that the cause of reappearance of life in broth was bacteria in dust, but not the empty air. To prove this, he designed a special swan neck flask that allowed light air to contact with broth, but precluded a heavy dust particles to get to the broth in the flask. After boiling the liquid in the flask, and leaving it for a while, he didn't find any microorganisms inside. Then he repeated experiment, but this time, after boiling liquid in the flask and killing all microorganisms, he cut off the upper part of the flask, opening the axis for dusty air to the liquid. After a while, live microorganisms appeared in the liquid. Thus, Pasteur proved that microorganisms are not born in empty air, but disseminated by other live microorganisms. Therefore, Pasteur suggested that diseases do not appear in the body from nothing, as many scholars previously thought. 
but are transmitted through germs that densely inhabit the environment. Thus, the germ theory of the origin of disease was born. But at that time, Pasteur didn't go beyond this general conception, because he suffered a stroke and was forced to focus on restoring his own health. German physician Robert Koch continued to develop and deepen the germ theory. He was primarily interested in attribution of certain bacteria to specific diseases. To achieve this goal, he developed a method of isolating and growing pure cultures of bacteria. This method was later called the Koch's postulates. According to these postulates, four steps has to be made to attribute bacteria to specific disease. By the first step, the microorganism must be found in abundance in all organisms suffering from the disease, but should not be found in healthy organisms. By the second step, the microorganisms must be isolated from the diseased organism and grown in the pure culture. By the third step, the cultured microorganism should cause disease when introduced in the healthy organism. By the fourth step, the organism must be re-isolated from the inoculated diseased experimental host and identified as being identical to the original specific causative agent. This method allowed Robert Koch to detect the causative agents of anthrax, cholera, and tuberculosis. After learning about the success of his rival, Robert Koch, Pasteur returned to his work with microorganisms. He was trying to understand how Jenner's vaccination worked. Using Koch's anthrax bacterium, Pasteur experimented to find the way to attenuate its virulence and finally succeeded in producing a vaccine. Then he staged a public demonstration. He took 60 domestic animals and ejected half of them with living attenuated bacteria of anthrax. Two weeks later, he repeated the vaccination to boost immunity. After another two weeks, he introduced a virulent anthrax culture to all experimental animals. Just a few days later, all unvaccinated animals died or got severely sick. But the vaccinated animals were fine. The success of this experiment suggested the possibility of preparing vaccines against other diseases by attenuating the infective agent. So it became clear how the generous smallpox vaccine worked and how to make vaccines against other infections. But two more questions remained unanswered. What exactly happens in the body during the acquaintance with bacteria and why in some infectious diseases it is impossible to detect any bacteria. Ilya Mechnikov, a pupil of Karazin University, took the first step toward answering the question about immunity. In 1882 he discovered phagocytes, cells that absorb bacteria, and coined the phagocytosis, the process of absorption of bacteria, by phagocytes. If Rudolf Virchow compared the organism with the state and cells with citizens, Mechnikov compared phagocytes with an army that protects the state from pathogenic enemies. Referring to Hippocrates, Mechnikov pointed out that the phagocytes were what was really standing behind the healing power of organism. The discovery of this protective mechanism marked the beginning of understanding of the body's immune response to pathogens and started the new science immunology. Finding an answer to the second question concerning the inability to detect the pathogen of some infections was much longer and more difficult. In 1884, to purify drinking water from bacteria, Pasteur's student Charles Chamberlain improved the design of a ceramic filter which was invented earlier, at the beginning of the 19th century. The design 
was based on a vessel with a ceramic filter inside. The filter had such small pores that bacteria couldn't pass through. Therefore, when entering the vessel, the water passed through the filter into the inner part and became clear of bacteria that remained in the outer part of the vessel. In addition to commercial success, the filter began to be used for scientific purposes, to separate bacteria from liquids. In 1887, Russian microbiologist Dmitry Ivanovsky studied tobacco mosaic disease in Ukraine. He considered the cause of the disease to be a bacterium, and therefore tried to isolate it with a Chamberlain filter. But all his efforts were in vain, so he suggested that the pathogen was not bacteria, but the poison that remains from them. This hypothesis was supported and developed further by the Dutch microbiologist Martinus Beering. But for the convenience of worldwide use, he chose the Latin word for poison, the virus. So it was long believed that viruses were the venomous liquid left from bacteria. But in 1935, the virus of tobacco mosaic disease was crystallized, and in 1941, the first photograph of this virus was taken. As a result, it was proved that viruses are not liquid, but particles with a complex structure that consist of protein capsid with RNA or DNA inside. So another huge step in understanding pathology was made. But it was still unclear how virus works, because people still didn't understand the role of DNA. Back in 1927, Russian biologist Nikolai Kaltsov suggested that DNA plays the role of gene transfer. But to confirm this hypothesis, there was not enough material and capabilities. The discovery of the structure of viruses returned the attention of scientists to the study of DNA and its role in pathology. In 1944, physician Oswald Avery discovered that bacteria can transmit their virulence through DNA. But everyone refused to believe in the important role of DNA because its structure seemed to be too simple to transmit information for inheritance. Therefore, it has long been believed that genetic information is transmitted not with DNA, but with its protein shell. But further study of viruses has shown that it is DNA that acts as a carrier of information in them, while the protein only forms a capsid, the role of which is to protect and preserve DNA until it enters the bacteria. This became known through the study of bacteriophages by Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase. Bacteriophages are viruses that hunt bacteria. They were discovered in Ganges River in 19th century and believed to be effective killers of cholerobacteria. In 1952, Hershey and Chase managed to mark protein capsid of bacteriophage and DNA inside of it with different isotopes. After infecting bacteria with marked bacteriophages, they found isotopes of DNA inside of bacteria, but not from protein capsid, proving that DNA is what destroying host and protein is just a case to safely transfer DNA to its victim. At the same time, chemists showed that DNA is based on a repeating chain of nucleotides guanine, adenine, cytosine, and thymine. It was believed that DNA is composed of a large number of repeating sequences of these nucleotides. But in early 1950s, Irvin Chargaff proved that these nucleotides can be in different sequences and that amount of adenine is always the same as thymine, and amount of cytosine is always the same as guanine, meaning that they form 
a chain of mirrored pairs. This discovery suggested that DNA is a complex double code that can encrypt information. Chargoff shared this idea with two young biologists, Francis Crick and James Watson, who were eager to reveal the structure of DNA. In order to study DNA, it was necessary to understand its structure. Many scientists of that time tried to figure out this question, including Crick and Watson. But the closest to success was a young chemist, Rosalind Franklin. At the King's College of London, she managed to take the best DNA picture of the time and to make calculations that suggested her that the DNA had a helix structure. But Franklin was not yet sure whether this helix was consisted of one, two or three strands. She didn't want to draw premature conclusions, so she continued her research. Crick and Watson were more determined. They attended Franklin's lecture and learning of her hypothesis offered her to help in interpretation of the picture she had taken. For Rosalind Franklin, these two young men seemed too impudent and immature, so she refused to cooperate with them. But Franklin's rival from the same laboratory revealed some information about her research and gave Crick and Watson one of the best pictures she was working on, the famous photo number 51. In a hurry to make a sensational discovery, Crick and Watson studied the photo and built a hypothetical model of double helix DNA structure. That evening, celebrating their victory in a pub, they announced to their colleagues that they had revealed the secret of life. In the meantime, feeling harassed at workplace, Franklin left the prestigious science lab and began to work in a quieter but small lab at the outskirts of London. All her achievements and calculations were left at the King's College and had been given to Crick, Watson and Maurice Wilkins, the very same guy who leaked the photo 51. Based on Franklin's materials and their hypothesis, they published an article in the Nature Journal and decade later received the Nobel Prize for discoveries of the molecular structure of DNA and its significance for information transfer in living material. Just four years before this great event, Rosalind Franklin had died of cancer at the age of 37. Later, the knowledge of the function, composition and structure of DNA allowed not only to study genetic diseases, but also provided an opportunity to fill the study of the human body and the possibilities of its treatment. Therefore, in the last two centuries, the perception of health and disease, which has been slowly taking shape thousands of years, has changed almost completely. The peak of these revolutionary changes occurred between the mid-19th and 20th centuries. Primarily, due to the discovery of the role of bacteria, viruses, and the DNA in the human life. Thus, many historians of medicine believe that until the 19th century, doctors were not only unable to help their patients, but on the contrary, harmed humans with their false theories and unnecessary interventions. As we have seen in previous topics, there is much to support this opinion. But still, there were some ideas that modern doctors still can rely on today. In addition, only the accumulation of knowledge in previous periods allowed the 19th century to become an era of scientific discoveries. As we have seen, the state's support for science, flexibility and freedom of thought have led to great discoveries and development of understanding of human health. Conversely, rigidity and prohibitions turned scientific development into the opposite direction. That is all for the first part of the lecture.